Welcome to the Basic Income Show. I'm Scott Santens, and my co-hosts are Conrad Shaw and Josh Worth. And uh, we got a lot to talk about this week. Uh, we haven't been here for a few weeks, so uh, stay tuned here for a lot of, of basic income news. Yeah, I'm excited. This is where I check in for my news from Scott. My, and it's been <laughs> a few weeks, so it's like, what's going All on right. in the world of UBS? And uh, our, our, our theme song this week, uh, I went with uh, kind of a, a scarish kind of uh, darker yeah, version for for Halloween. Yeah. I don't know. It's just a mm. little bit a little bit off. So nice. uh, yeah, enjoy. This intro music is AI generated. Love it or hate it, no one was compensated. One more artist wonders where their money will come from. One more example of the need for basic income. Kind of, kind of dark. That fits for Halloween, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's going to be stuck in my head all day. Not. Yeah. There's a, some, some night variers involved with, uh, with that one. So yeah, so uh, let's start off with the um, the biggest news. The uh, we just released a press release for this just on on Monday, and that news is I am uh, proud to share that the Income to Support All Foundation has reached its one point five million fundraising goal for this year, and now our first two key projects, Comel and Bootstraps, are fully funded. And so for those who have been listening, you know, we talk about these two projects quite often with Josh working on Commingle and uh, Conrad always sharing stuff from, from Bootstraps. And we're just so excited that, uh, that these are fully greenlit and will be out next year. It's really hard to express uh, how excited and how exciting that is. Yeah, we, uh, we've been waiting for this news and building toward it for like uh, Daya and I for eight years on bootstraps and then Josh and I for over four years on commingle. And um, from the beginning, we had this sort of absurdly idealistic vision of not compromising what we were doing. And that means no shareholders, you know, no certain types of investments. And we've gotten it in totally, uh, totally charitably grant funded. And we're now we're greenlit to the end, which is, which is really important to understand is, it's basically like a basic income for the foundation and the projects, which equals, um, and one way to look at it is it's fuck you money. So we don't have to, you know, beg and plead and compromise what we're trying to do. We're going to be able to, to deliver it without ever catering to shareholders who want to maximize profit or catering to networks who want it to be in a certain format and want to limit impact campaign work um we kind of get to set the terms because we didn't accept any money that had strings on it and it might have been stupid to do that and idealistic but <laughs> after a long time it worked out so i'm really excited for what we're going to bring next year yeah it's really yeah nice we're really going working. with a if you build it they will come mentality yeah it's nice to be building it without that constant fear of like are we going to run out of money? Is this uh, suddenly going to fall apart as we're building it? So yeah, having some kind of uh, certainty, a guaranteed income is uh, pretty, pretty important for the project itself. Ken Yang yeah, I mean, on the Twitter chat says venture capital for, by the people for venture capital for the people. Uh, that's kind of a fun way to look at it. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, instead of shareholders, we have stakeholders and and as we, now that we have this funding, one of the things we've been sort of punting while we had to focus primarily on development, like bootstrapping development on commingle, is uh, putting together a legal framework that backs up what we've been wanting to do, uh, which is restructure the company to stay mission aligned long term to be built, like whether it's a purpose trust or a cooperative to really do the work to like set that up and put it in the bylaws that you know, this is not going to turn into someday like a, a medium for shoving ads in your face or doing anything but like focusing on public benefit and and like what we can bring to the members and the, the general population. 
I just want to emphasize too how bootstrap this is, you know, and in it's just such a it's a great word to use considering the bootstraps docu series as well. But I mean, this is something that you know, it's it, so many projects are you, you come up with all the money before you even start, and this has not been that way. I mean, the, both of these projects are these are important, and we just got to do what we can to get them going. And we just got to like, you know, hope that we can actually get enough to to finish it. So it's just been this constant, just scratching, just constantly for the next bit and never knowing what was going to happen. And just basically like trusting in people, which is just so part of the basic income ethos too, you know? And so it's just, it's, it just feels so good for that, you know, trust to be rewarded to actually have, um, you know, to, to pull these off. It's also very much like the entrepreneurial side of the argument for UBI is, uh, you know, people have more risk tolerance. So, yeah. you know, Daya and I for the series and Josh and I for, and for the, for commingle, you know, we have a certain amount of risk tolerance afforded to us by like whatever levels of privilege we have and the ability, like, you know, I always knew my family could back me up if everything really went badly, or I could always go back to a job with my engineering degree and like cobble it back together. Uh, a lot of people don't have that. So it was our ability to be sort of recklessly optimistic and ambitious that allowed us to build something that pretty much everyone when we were talking to early on, you know, didn't believe was possible uh, and said, you should just do, you know, half as many people for half as long for the series all in one place. And commingle should really try to fit this one little niche and take investment dollars because that's the way things get done. You know, what happens in a world where everybody in every little thing they're pursuing in their life has that ability to take on, take on a little less extra risk to do it the way they think it needs to be done right, rather than ceding to the way the world tells you it's supposed to be done, you know, which is a sense, which is generally like by permission of the capital class, the, the owners of wealth with terms that, that add all these little strings about what you have to do with it and how it needs to endlessly, you know, enrich somebody. So what is, what, what is the economy in the world look like when everyone kind of has that fuck you money or that fuck yes money to whatever, um, to, to say no to a bad deal or to pursue a higher ideal. I think that's a that's a good segue to the this next thing that I wanted to to talk about too, which is um, you know more recently the the Nobel Prize winning Nobel Prize the Nobel Prize winners came out, and three of them are supportive of of basic income, but I just think this chart is so like damning of this world that we live in, where you know we pretend it's a meritocracy, but you know, when it comes to winning a Nobel Prize, like these are the people that that got great starts in life. They have that that some kind of you know cushion to their family. They have that risk tolerance. They have the access to capital. You know, they're they're able to like go into the studies in in profession that they that they really want to do. There's like a passion there for stuff that they're pursuing, and they're the ones that win the Nobel prizes. Like if we actually had a, a meritocracy where people are able to, you know, be born to any parents anywhere, then you would expect this chart to to be kind of more of a, a flat line kind of situation where, you know, it's the equivalent across all the different income ranks. But that's not the case. It's it's really if you're if you're born at the top, then that's where you're most likely going to be the one who wins a Nobel Prize. And if you're so, what are we looking you know, at here? Poverty, this is a you're not. This is a chart of uh, the the income of the fathers of the people that won Nobel prizes. Is... Yep, that's correct. Right, and okay. what what you know, decile population they fall into. Uh -huh. Yeah, so it's like all you could see. Basically, it's all top ten percent. You know, with like a little bit below you've got you know if you're if you're upper middle class you've got some chance but um if you're like in the bottom 70 percent you've got a very very tiny tiny chance of actually yeah. being in a profession 
that and you win a Nobel Prize. I think Prize. there's a couple angles too. One is, you know, uh, the connection side of it where it's like, uh, you know, you, you get set on the right path early in terms of, and, and, and always in terms of like when you decide you want to pursue a degree that might not, um, and a level of degree that might not be something pe other people see as feasible, like too expensive or it takes too long or not going to pay enough has a lot to do with your, your parents' connections and money. But also it reminds me of, uh, you ever read uh, Outliers, the, Ma the Malcolm Gladwell thing, and the basic premise of the 10,000 hours to become an expert at something. And there's that great example of the hockey players in Canada, who the, the, the statistics are that most hockey players have birthdays between like whatever the, you know, November and February or something like that. Um, and it's not just a weird glitch. It's well, it is sort of a weird glitch. It's not just a coincidence, though. It's the fact that like when hockey starts in Canada, in the leagues that they have in the little leagues, and you're, you know, five years old or whatever, if you're on the one side of the age gap, then you get put into the group of five year olds playing with four year olds, or, you know, 4.9 year olds playing with 4.1 year olds or six, you know, whatever it is, you've got like a six months advantage. And that's 10% of your life. That's huge. So you, you naturally are bigger, stronger, better at that time. You pick it up faster, at which point you get funneled into the, the more competitive teams. So you're playing against better kids and you play, you know, five times a week instead of two times a week and you get your 10,000 hours. It's the same sort of thing in every sort of field uh, where you're gaining a level of expertise is the more time you have to do it and the more practice against the higher competition, the more you'll thrive in it. So there's even a merit meritocratic element of that, where it's like these Nobel prize winners are actually like very competent, but a lot of other people could have grown into that position. Were they given the same sorts of opportunities? They, uh, you're saying that the people that are, um, some of these winners are supporters of basic income. What, what's their deal? Yeah, uh, so I know most people are interested in, okay, what about the economic Nobel winners? And uh, so one of them this year was Simon Johnson, and I thought it was interesting how he actually wrote a blurb for one of Guy Standing's books, and you can see that here. He said, uh, base income is an idea whose time for serious debate has come. Guy Standing illuminates the way in this lucid and well-argued book and uh let's see yeah, that what are the book comments? was uh, are there people a guide for the open-minded are there people saying like you know my toddler knows economics better than this nobel prize winner or is that credibility landing in the twitter in the twitter cesspool yeah it uh it basically never really never really matters uh, even though you know, i put out a, an essay before kind of uh collating all the different Nobel Prize winners. And at, at the time when I published that, there were 11 Nobel Prize winners, living Nobel Prize winners, who had uh, expressed support for universal basic income. And since then, I think one, at least one of them has died since I created that list. And now there's, with this year, it was just, this is the most I've seen. I have to update that to add these three. But um the winners were also, um, it was two AI people. And, and that was interesting in this Nobel Prize round anyways, is that it seemed like AI played quite a role. They, you could tell the Nobel Committee wanted to uplift AI. And so uh, it was the physics Nobel and the chemistry Nobel where these were, were winners. So um, yeah, one of them was Hinton, and that was for physics. And that was for, you know, his, he's considered to be like one of the godfathers, you know, of, of, of AI. And uh, so that was, was pretty cool to see him win that. And then kind of odd was uh, Chemistry Nobel too. And that went to, I don't know exactly how to pronounce his name correctly, Demis Hassabis or Hassabi. He's well known for, for his AI work too. And he has, you know, come out and said, because of AI and the impacts, then we should be looking into basic income. I'll to, it's just interesting that you've got these, the people who are the, the most knowledgeable of AI, who are right at the forefront in doing this pioneering work in AI, they're the ones who are out there 
saying, look, this is going to be important. Yeah. Um, and it gets so much attention, AI, as like the reason for basic income. But I mean, I'm, I'm glad it's, to me, it's an accelerant to the reason that always existed, which is you need to un unlock human potential and agency. And the more we're attached to the labor market at a time where it's, you know, failing us, the more necessary that is. But that doesn't mean it wasn't necessary before AI. It's, it's frustrating and encouraging, you know, at the same time with the discussion of basic income through AI. You know, like on the one hand, great people are talking about this, but like when you're talking about it through automation, you're talking about it as in a, in case of emergency, break glass, we are expecting this, this unemployment to hit. It's going to be hard for people to find work. And therefore, we need basic income then. And then you see it as an income replacement program. And when you do that, you miss like just how much benefit there is from basic income. And then you also presume that it needs to be particularly high because, you know, if the median income is $60,000 and no one can find a job anymore, then you're thinking, well, the income, the UBI needs to be. $60,000 at least because no one will be able to find any jobs. And then, you know, that's not accurate. Like there's still going to be jobs and that's going to be on top of the basic income. So it just like really confuses the, the conversation, even though right, people are talking about it. And it leans into these simplistic arguments that even a lot of UBI advocates are confused about like the purpose of, of basic income and the idea of, you know, what happens with the labor market. Is it replacing the entire labor market or is it changing equilibriums and how it works and like why and when and how we choose to work and for what? So the whole argument when people got, get out there and say, well, new jobs have always been created in the past and they will in the future. And sure, yeah, there'll be new jobs. And the question is, when those new jobs are created, are they going to pay as much? Are they going to be reliable? Are they going to be like really sporadic gig work? Do we want people's entire livelihood and healthcare and everything attached to them? Like, here's how we make whatever the new jobs are, like less burdened with the responsibility of, of being a last line of defense for everyone's safety, because they're becoming less and less reliable in general. I guess uh, let's talk next about what's going on in, in Oregon. I think it'd be good to cover too. And we've talked about this before, you know, about the Oregon rebate, I think is still, there's a lot of people who don't know. So let's just cover this again, that there's a measure in Oregon that would basically do what Alaska is doing, but instead of oil funding this, that this would be a higher corporate tax on large corporations earning over $25 million a year. And this would be just a 3% tax. And because of this looking to tax large corporations, there is a ton of money from these large corporations going into to fighting this proposal. This is, you know, it's over $15 million that's been put into this by them on advertisements. I'm hearing that people are just inundated in Oregon with these ads against this measure in Oregon. Yeah, I've had people- Have you seen any of the ads? Me, I haven't seen any of, the, any of the ads. I've had friends in Oregon telling me about it and being like, oh, it seems like there's questions about how this would be paid for even like supporters of UBI that are worried about it, like the ads are being effective. A lot of them are pointing out sort of disingenuine, disingenuously, these sort of attacks um, that, you know, the, the, the tax will be passed on to the customer as like a, a higher cost, which is generally true. You know, the, the businesses need to maintain some sort of profit margin. And if they're riding near it, then they need to pass on that, that, that cost. But the way that works out in practice is the, the higher spenders are the ones who aren't recouping or aren't paying back let me how do i put this the people who buy less stuff the amount of extra costs in those taxes is far less than the amount of basic income that they're getting and the only people who pay extra in taxes than the 
then the basic income they got are the people who spend a ton of money, which is exactly what you want, where the whole thing is essentially funded through a tax mechanism that, you know, that becomes progressive and it, it helps out the people at the bottom of the spectrum and lets the people at the top of the spectrum pay into it. Um, but they don't ever get into that detail. They just say things are going to cost more, period. And everyone's like, oh, that doesn't seem good. My my expenses will go up. You know, but if your expenses go up 200 bucks and you get 1600, then that's a good thing. One of the things that annoyed me that I that I found from multiple replies like on Twitter and stuff is uh progressives in Oregon saying that they support UBI in theory, but they don't like how this is universal and that they think it should be means tested. And I just, you know, want to pull out my hair when I read stuff like this, where, you know, you you don't support UBI if you think that it shouldn't be universal. You don't get it. Like the the reasoning behind this being fully universal, and it's it's the most universal that I've seen any policy proposal be. Like this is anyone in Oregon who's lived there for 200 days, like anyone. So this is this completely fully universal. And the logic behind it, of course, and those who understand UBI truly is that if you have that full universality, then you're not leaving out anybody. Um, but if you if you say, oh, well, we should leave out the billionaires, then great, you just put it a test. And now in order just to exclude like a handful of people, now you're going to exclude many people who actually need it because of that test. And that's what just bothers me, especially to see people saying. It's like a cognitive dissonance too. That that tax we were just talking about is what makes up for the fact that you're giving it to everybody. So you give it to Bezos and you know he he gets his sixteen hundred dollars, but he that you know extra you know two point something percent tax on on his nice Nike shoes and all like whatever he gets from the companies that are seeing that tax adds up to more than sixteen hundred dollars. So you're not giving it to him. That's how that's how you work it out. Whereas, like, there's a real problem with virtue signaling on the progressive side, where it's like we need to show that we really understand, you know, the uh, the oppression, the oppression stack and who are the most needy and whatever. And what they end up doing is barring most of the people that they seek to help from, from whatever support, because they of this desire to show that they get it. They're belies that they really don't get it. And it, it's part of the never ending struggle with like the political discourse. That is why I'm excited to just do it in the private sector and like demonstrate to people with commingle like this is how it actually works and look we're actually getting to everybody and we can reach way more of the population that you purport to care about by doing it universally some more stuff that's, that's kind of bothering me about this too are it's it's a real like letting the the perfect be the enemy of the good kind of situation like it always makes me think of you know nixon's proposal back in the 70s where you know was that perfect no of course not but was it better than the status quo? Yes. Um, but it didn't happen. So we didn't see that improvement. And then so here, one of the biggest attack vectors, and this is something that the corporations are really pushing, is that this is, um, you know, it uses a, a tax on, on gross receipts and not profit. And so, you know, with that, there's a reason behind that. You know, it's, it's that if you just are taxing profit, then you could have like a billion dollar or trillion dollar corporation that's paying virtually no tax because they're reporting like they have no profits. This is like setting up some kind of mechanism where they're paying some minimum amount of tax based on their revenue. And, you know, you can say that there's better ways of going about it than that. But um, that's also to say that there's no reason that that this couldn't be passed and then could be improved upon. You know, like there could be there could be other things that can be passed. This they could work with the legislature, you know, to even improve the rollout of this when it's rolled out. It's not honest to say, okay, well, this is going to pass as it is, and and there's not going to be any working with people to to get it right, and that there's nothing that can be done later on. Uh, I like when we listened to the presentation by Antonio at the the basic income 
uh, conferences here, I liked how he mentioned, if you don't like the rich getting this, then there's no reason that, you know, we couldn't pass another law after this goes in that says, let's add like a 0.1% surtax to income. So, you know, that would be nothing to most people, uh, but it would equal more than $1,600 in additional tax for the very top, like 5% of income earners or whatever. So you could do the separate thing to function as this phase out that let's say someone is saying, oh, I'm not going to vote on this because it's going to the top 5%. You know, it's just, it it bothers me how many people let the perfect be the enemy of the good instead of thinking, let's do this. And, you know, this would reduce, it's estimated to reduce poverty if passed by 59%. This is, it would just be massive because of the, because of its full universal, like that is where the huge impact comes from uh, when it comes to reducing poverty is universality. Well, using that phrase, the perfect being the enemy of the good, I don't even think is appropriate here. This is letting the good be the enemy of the better. Like as you described, it's is actually the better way to do it to base the tax on revenue because then the company has to face that tax and pay it and then pass it on to the, the consumers. But that's the way it should go rather than avoiding it. Like a story from, if you're in the film world, um, a lot of people don't know there's tons of stories in your contract, whether you're an actor or a director or whatever, where you get a cut of the profits of the film based on based on profits, not based on ticket sales. And so like there's, I remember there was an article going around how like the actors um, in Return of the Jedi didn't get any royalties because they recorded it as a loss. And there's a lot of ways to pretend that you don't actually have a profit. You can hire your cousin to be a consultant and pay them $10 million. And oops, that wasn't profit. It just doesn't count anymore. And no one gets a cut of it. Right. So you can, you can use all these loop loopholes when they call it net profits, but when you call it revenues, you have to bake it in to your, your business model. And then you actually get, seen. You know, another thing to point out too is this is a state tax. If you're a giant corporation and you pay a bit more in state tax, then, you know, you can subtract that from your federal tax. And so, you know, it's not necessarily even necessary to pass this on to the consumer because it can also just be passed on um, in the in the form of paying like, less in federal taxes. This I, this assumption that um, you know this will somehow hurt these corporations and like you know, they'll flee Oregon or whatever is also disingenuous when you know paying more in state and less in federal um, can be neutral for some of these companies too. Right, and there's one other thing that I think is really hilarious to me in in a dark way, which is you know you see like Antonio, who's the sweetest person I've ever met in my life. Um, and like the, some of their funders being cast as like, this is like big, dark money interest right, right. Like from this California. Is outside California money. And, yeah. And, and it's like, uh, the guy running for mayor, Dylan Herschel, who's like total sweetheart or like some guys who care about UBI and then see it as a really great opportunity to end poverty somewhere and set a precedent. And in total, they've raised, I don't know, like half a million bucks or something to do something at this scale, which is is like pennies uh, and people are painting them as like this big moneyed interest when the people, the ads coming yeah. against it are, it's like $10 million from Nike and whatever. Uh, and they're like the little small mom and pop businesses making over $25 million in sales in Oregon as if they, they don't have a conflict of interest in this matter. But like the, the messaging getting through to people is like, Ooh, this is dangerous and it's going to hurt businesses. And it's like, where is that messaging coming from and how disingenuous is it for these mega corporations to be yeah. like these activists as you know the landed wealthy capitalists like trying to pull something over yeah, just to is, give like really the benefit of the strange. doubt to the just to like consider that idea like would you say that uh gas prices have gone up uh, in Alaska because they have to pay their uh, annual dividend to the citizens there? Like, seriously, like. Yeah, no. 
I, I have actually never seen a study about that. It's it's interesting to yeah. to consider, but you know the way that it works too. And this is it's 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 weird how uh, you know the way that it works in Alaska is that it's more like a royalty function. So it's like um, it's like in order to gain the right to drill, then then some of this money from the revenue needs to go into, you know, the Alaska permanent fund. And so it's not technically a tax, it's a royalty kind of set up. Um, but the fact remains that there's less money, you know, going to the oil companies and of course then less money going to the oil company shareholders. And then so you could see this as like a tax on oil companies and oil company shareholders, even though it isn't. And, you know, sure, I don't know if that's somehow increasing the price of oil to some degree, maybe it is slightly, but I don't know. But either way, it has all these positive impacts, and especially with reducing poverty in Alaska, and of course, all these other things we've talked about before that's result in Alaska too. Well, a better example is uh, a carbon tax funded basic income. Uh, so that, yeah. that you would directly see a little extra cost um per gallon at the pump you might see things that are made of plastic cost a little bit more uh, but people just say that and leave it at that and say oh it'll cost more it's not worth it but um that's one of the things i analyzed in the ubi calculator was a, a basic income national fa basic income based on a carbon tax um and there is a break-even point with this just like anything else where um it's like 75 percent um 77% in this model come out ahead, right? So you see an extra, you know, um, 50 cents at the at the pump times however many gallons you're getting over the course of the year, but you also get an extra $1,000 that year. It more than overcomes it um, because the people in the, in the lower classes tend to consume less fossil fuels in general. Like once you start getting bigger houses and flying across country or inter internationally a few times, then you'll see enough extra price at the pump or the airplane tickets that you'll be funding this mechanism. 75% of the population get more money in, in the basic income out of a carbon tax and dividend um, than not. Yeah. I'm just curious, so, like, as how a, can people actually fall for that, uh, for that line of thinking? Like you see something on the ballot that says you're going to get more money every year. <laughs> like the, the ballot is to give you money. But the focus has now turned to like, but it's going to tax the corporations that I love so much. And then I, I, my <laughs> shoes will cost more now. But and somehow that works like that is convincing people that uh, it's, uh, it's yeah. a reason to not vote for it. It's very strange. I think there's some it, devil you know there, right? Like I've learned to basically live and survive in the paradigm as it is. Now you're talking about changing something in a way that raises questions that I'm not sure about because I haven't seen it before. Might as well just stick to trying to win the game that I'm trying to win. And I think that works less and less as more people fall out of the middle class into poverty. And the, the question forever is like, when are we suffering enough that either we fix something or we all kill each other? Or is it a frog in the pot of boiling water situation? Um and it's just scary to make such a big, it is a big and fundamental change to to make these sort of adjustments to the economy. So I sort of understand people like being sensitive to these arguments. And it's a shame that these arguments are so lean into it so disingenuously just to say, just to sort of imply that this will collapse the economy because it'll cost more money for these things without really actually being honest about the numbers. Well, what's What's funny and frustrating about this too is like if you were to go up to you know 100 people in Oregon on the street and ask them if they support higher taxes on the biggest corporations then i bet like 9 out of 10 people would say yes like it, it's it's really popular uh to ask people you know should we tax the rich should we tax big corporations and what's so what's so fascinating to me is that despite that being the case when it really comes down to it, it's amazing how much money these big corporations and the rich can like put into influencing people. And then, you know, they will swear up and down that they haven't been influenced. You know, they just happen to dislike the details of this. Um, so like, you know, 
there there is no asterisk when you get asked about do you support like taxes on the biggest corporations but then there kind of is you know where 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 people are when it comes down to it they're like apparently well i don't support it being done in this way or this way or this way uh but i would support this way and then you know it's a matter of finding consensus to some amount and that's really hard to find consensus so you know when it comes to like any kind of even basic income poll uh, if you ask people if they support it, a lot of people do. Uh, but then as soon as you start asking for details and then say, well, do you support a basic income done this way or this way or this way, then you see those those reductions in support. Well, you also, it just highlights just how powerful, you know, money and politics yeah. can be in swaying opinions. Like people think they really consider all this ins and outs, but what they're considering is, from what they've seen. If 99% of what they're seeing is the argument in one way, they're going to be swayed because, you know, very few people have the time to deep dive into an issue the way we do as like a full-time job. You know, so if, if everything that they're being told is one thing, that's generally going to be more or less what they believe. I think it's hilarious and, and also frustrating to see what's going on in Ontario too. So that's the next thing I want to talk about. For those who don't know, uh, Doug Ford became premier of Ontario uh, years ago. And when he did, he canceled the basic income pilot that was meant to be for, it was meant to be a three-year pilot and it was in multiple sites, and one of them was even a saturation site. So this was essentially everyone in this in the town of Hamilton, um, which was who was in poverty, um, would have been lifted out of poverty for three years. And prior to that election, he was asked directly about the basic income pilot, and you know if he would cancel it because people were worried about that, and he said no, I'm not going to cancel the pilot. Like, you know, I believe in in science and evidence, and I think that we should let this let this play out and see what happens. And then he wins the election, and he was asked again, like, okay, so now you won. Are you going to let this pilot finish? And he said, you know, of course I'm going to let it play out. And then like a, a few weeks or a, a month later or something, he uh, announces that he's canceling the pilot. So he went in there, and and then the excuse for canceling the pilot too uh, was that it was you know too expensive. It was a it was a hundred and fifty million dollar pilot, and they'd already spent you know fifty million dollars, and they would have spent another hundred million dollars. So his logic was you know we're saving a hundred million dollars, and you know like a job is the best form of of basic income. It was like what they were talking about back then, and how like you know free money would 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 hurt people. And so now here we are, and there's expected to be an election soon. And he is saying, oh, I think that we should send everybody a $200 rebate check, fully universal. It's going to everyone in Ontario. And it just happens to be, you know, he wants people to get money right before the election. Clearly, it, there's there's reasoning behind this of thinking, I want people to to look and and see that I provided them with two hundred dollars, and um, it's just it's the 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 blatant like just hypocrisy of this is just astounding, and this is three billion dollars too. So he's going to spend three billion dollars on this rebate check, and he canceled the basic income pilot. To save one hundred million dollars. Yeah, yeah, not a fan. Is he so? He's up for re-election soon. Do they know if he's gonna? Is he expected to win? I haven't seen any polling about um, about his his potentially winning or not. But uh, I do expect that you know when he does this, so he'll, he'll get a boost from it. It it does make a difference. Like it's it was it was really smart of Trump. Um, to put his name on the stimulus checks. Uh, I believe as Obama just uh, mentioned recently, 
in a um, like a rally speech that he did, he was talking about how how people really like the stimulus check and how Trump isn't the one who passed that. Congress did, and he just put his name on it. And that that when Biden also did the same thing with stimulus checks, he didn't put his name on it. And then when Obama did a similar thing during the economic crisis in his administration. He actually didn't send a stimulus check. He did like a, a payroll tax reduction, which was kind of invisible. And like he's even the the logic there was um, he even said there during the speech was that they just wanted to do the right thing. They didn't care about taking credit. And that's not smart. You know, the, the smart thing to do is actually what Trump did and take credit for it. And so if Doug Ford, he's clearly doing this, he wants to take credit for it. He's saying, I am do- the one doing this. It's smart politics. It does enjoy, get you a boost. Enjoy your Ford bucks. Yeah. Um, I think uh, that's a big part of how a UBI should be designed, too, because it's sort of human nature, especially in such a busy world. When things get easier for you, you get accustomed to it and you start thinking, oh, yeah, and you, you forget how, how crappy it was before. So if a UBI was set up so everyone was getting a certain amount of money, um, but it was set up to just look like a reduction in their taxes. You don't notice it so much, like a little less of my paycheck is getting taken. Whereas if you get a, a separate check, a separate line item in your bank ledger once a month or once a week or whatever, that this is the money that dropped in for your basic income, it is very visible, sends a very clear message, and they can still be aware of like, oh, my taxes went up a little bit uh, and and see how much it went up and see how it compares. But, but not miss the fact entirely that they are now getting this support. The next thing I wanted to cover was, and this is actually we're just kind of talking about this too with the with the polling. So this seems appropriate to cover next. This was polling in the UK done about support for universal basic income there, and kind of the the headline from this poll is that. 46% of those asked this uh, support UBI, and that's opposed to 33% of those who oppose it. A, a significant number of more people support it than oppose it. And there's still actually a 20% of people actually don't know. That kind of just tells me that there's just still so much that people don't know about it. And also maybe those are also honest people who kind of are like, well, it depends. I don't know if, if there was a, if they had split that up and said support, oppose, don't know where it depends, how, how many people would have said it depends on the details. But it's just interesting, I think, that such a, such a large percentage of people just don't know. And there's, there is some more details in this too that were asked. One of the questions was if it was introduced approximately what level should it be at? And 50% of people supported it at a level that is at least enough to pay for a person's basic living costs, even if they have no other form of income. And 45% supported it at a level that is enough to cover some basic living costs, but is expected to be supplemented by other income. That's the kind of thing where I wish there were numbers uh, because you know so much, it's very relative. Five hundred dollars per month versus a thousand dollars per month, or is it a thousand dollars per month versus two thousand dollars per month? You know, if you ask people what's enough to cover basic expenses, people are going to say different numbers. So I don't really know how much that says about like optimal number for maximum support, but at least conceptually speaking, people seem to support the idea of, of, let's say, a poverty level amount, like eliminating poverty versus partially eliminating poverty, I guess. Hey, I think we should step back for a second because we were talking about the Oregon thing and Josh just found a, one of the attack videos. It's like, okay, $6.8 billion across, you know, a whole state from the large corporations that are selling more than $25 million. It sort of implies that he's going to see the extra tax as a small company in terms of taxing on their own profits, but then clarified some of the products that he has to buy to deliver his services will cost more. Um, what he, what they didn't mention is it's like, uh, 
Oregon has one of the lowest corporate tax rates in the country, and they'd be bumping it up to like 3% from 1% um, and still be one of the lowest in the country. And yes, he can absolutely pass that on to the customers, and he's protected in doing so because every single business competing with him also faces that extra tax that adds to their profit margin. So it's not a competitive disadvantage. He just has to build in that extra like 1% and do his prices. Uh, so he's not actually affected they also by don't, that. Well, he is if he's also getting extra money to cover that. So <laughs> they're failing to mention that this like small business owner who's probably maybe struggling already financially, personally, uh, will have some extra money. That's not part of what we get to hear about. It's also not mentioning that there could be an impact where you're kind of subsidizing small businesses. You know, what you like, you're making them more competitive. If you make the larger companies less competitive by taxing them or whatever, and they have to raise their prices, small businesses don't. And so that could actually help with people deciding that it makes more sense to shop locally at these smaller businesses. So to have a small business owner say that, that they are going to be hurt by this is also like disingenuous in regards to the possible like impacts of, of them getting more shoppers, not only because, you know, the shoppers have more money, but because it kind of makes sense for them to go to the places that aren't raising their prices. Yeah. We, maybe we should try to get Antonio back on after the smoke is cleared and we can have a, a recap. Um, yeah, a post election learned. episode, or a, a nursing of wounds and planning for the future sort of discussion. I did want to go back just to some more from the polling. I think it's less interesting to ask people what they think about the impact on work will be. <laughs> Where like, who cares what people think? It's it's really you know, do they support it or not? But um, I guess here's a one that actually matters. I think which is. Uh, do you think that the UK could afford universal basic income? And so only 23% said they could that the country can afford it. And 56% said the country can't afford it. And then 21% said they don't know. So that's, you know, makes sense with the other 20% saying they don't know if they like it or not. But um, that's quite a difference to have like majority or uh, plurality of people saying they support it, but that they think that it's unaffordable. Yeah, it's a big issue with the messaging in general going out. It's also just kind of a in... normal tendency to like, whenever something sounds good, you're like, yeah, but we can't afford that. You know, it's, <laughs> yeah, it would be nice, but we'll never be able to afford that. That's just ridiculous. It's a very British sounding thing, you know, <laughs> oh, that must be too yeah. much. Yeah, and the context no in way. the UK too, they're like, they're like on the verge of austerity there, the labor party thing is what it is there came in and they're like gotta tighten that belt you know we just don't have any, any money gonna have to gonna have to do less back to something you said er, yeah back to something you said earlier about the uh the questions in britain like if when when they were asked like what uh what would be the right amount of money to give to people i was just thinking like what if you just ask people what if we gave everybody a million dollars Right. Like as everybody's going to say yes to that. But then there's also the I, I there, there's also going to be that same like, but of course, we could never afford that. But I think it's actually like a good question to ask. Like, what if you really could get a million dollars? It, like it, it's more aspirational. Like how how can we do this? How can we make this happen? Right. Like there's probably some way that we could actually do it. Right. And just it just to like get the the gears rolling as to like more of even if it is a fantasy it at least kind of like it, it raises the question like oh actually could we do that you know it's even if it is like a science fiction kind of thing like you know it, it, it's sort of like making the the aspiration well, higher Josh, than what's that... achievable so that's what I that's a that's a good uh, way to segue to what's happening in okay. uh, Guyana recently. All right, which was uh, the new president comes in and has announced that a fully universal two hundred thousand dollar cash grant to every household there that works out to about a thousand dollars USD. It's also not the first time that. 
Guyana has done this. They did this uh, during COVID too. It was a fully universal cash payment. For those who don't know, like they're recently very oil rich and they're basically trying to figure out what to do with all this, with all this money. And they just really seem to be leaning into the fully universal cash distributions. And it was actually pretty close to the recent presidential election. The candidate who lost was, was actually saying they should do UBI. And yet this, you know, the, the winner who comes in was not running on UBI and let still also, it wants to do these, these fully universal cash payments. Um, so I just want everyone to know that there's just some interesting stuff going on there with all this oil revenue. And it just seems like they've got a strong possibility that they could end up doing UBI at some point. Is there info about mind. how this proposal is being received? I haven't looked at that popularity of stuff um, of this, but again, it's, it's, it's so much easier when you're dealing in a situation where um, you're not like taxing people. And instead, it's seen like the Alaska dividend as being, this is um, like extra wealth. And what should we do with it? Who does the wealth belong to? Uh, should only a few people get rich off this wealth? Uh, should everybody? And, um, you know, clearly they're thinking, well, we should give this to everyone. And I just, I, I always am impressed when something is fully universal. So it's, it's good to see that happening there. Okay. Another one. There's more news. So this is Germany's voting on a big universal basic income experiment. What's interesting so much about this one is that this is via referendum, whereas like in Oregon, this was a signature initiative where they got on the signatures and now Oregon is voting on this program in, in Germany. They're voting on this, this pilot experiment in Hamburg. And so besides the fact that that's interesting, that this is the people deciding to do this, this big pilot, it's actually like, it's, it's big. It would be a three-year pilot. And it would be larger than the open research pilot by Sam Altman. So whereas uh, in that one, that was three years and a thousand people received the basic income in this one, uh, 2000 people would receive it for three years. And then what's different about this too, is that this kind of wants to look at universality. So, it, but instead of, of there being some kind of saturation site with like a smaller town, uh, this is in Hamburg, this is a, you know, a city doing this. But what they would do is actually they would select uh, whole streets, like basically, you know, neighborhoods and everyone in that in that area would get this basic income. And then they would compare like similar areas. So you would have like, you know, one whole street getting this and then they would find like a similar street that didn't get it. And you could compare these differences. So you wouldn't capture like this kind of macroeconomic effect where um you know it's like the like a whole city or town or something gets this money and therefore there's a lot more spending and then that kind of you know stimulates the economy to the point where you know, there's a lot more you know businesses and stuff like it's not that kind of of universal pilot experiment but what it would do is kind of by doing it like entire communities you could kind of tease out is there something there about like more community impact? Is there more like social cohesion? Do people feel kind of like closer to each other? Do they trust each other more? You know, what kind of impacts are there when an entire neighborhood gets it versus, you know, one or two people or something in that neighborhood? Right. I guess there's a little bit of a macro at the street level or the neighborhood level where you could a little bit kind of look at like how many more people are, you know, repainting their house and putting in gardens and like just like the general hygiene of the neighborhood uh but yeah, yeah or like, maybe there's like you know a local grocery store so there's like a store that the entire neighborhood goes to and they would clearly that i would expect that that business would get a boost and then so maybe you could tease that out you could say oh well you know this other similar street uh, it is also near a grocery store, and then you can compare those kind of things to see if there was some 
stimulative uh, spending. But yeah, I just like how there's uh, this kind of referendum kind of set up, um, you know, where like in Switzerland, they did this and it was going to be a permanent UBI and that failed. And then here, instead of also going for like a, a full program, like in Switzerland or Oregon, they're just saying, we really just want to test this and we want to do kind of a pioneering experiment, like something different instead of just doing the same thing. Like that's one of the things I don't like about all the stuff we're doing in the U.S. is a lot of these pilot experiments are very similar. Instead of trying to do something new and try to explore something new. So I like how this is unique. I haven't seen anything like this before. Do you happen to know if... Uh... It's related at all to, is it, there's a, a voluntary basic income type program that people were running in Germany. I haven't heard much about that lately, but I'm just wondering if there's any relation to what they oh, yeah. set up, the, the Grunden Common. There's a couple different things. Yeah, Grunden Common has been a program, um, you know, a privately funded program where they kind of did the lottery setup where anyone could join this lottery and anyone can donate to the lottery. And then every time they came up with 12,000 euros, uh, then they raffled that away to someone to have 1,000 1, euros a month for a year. And they've been doing that for years. And, uh, you know, at this point, hundreds of people, you know, have, have received this and there's lots of stories from it. And then they kind of extended that there was, um, more recently, there was a pilot where um, they were actually providing to a group. I don't remember how many people got this, um, but I believe that experiment is over now. And I think they're, I think we're waiting for the results from that. Uh, but there is like an actual study that's coming out of an actual pilot from Germany. Yeah, I would just Robert wonder if any question. of this. Okay, yeah. Go ahead. You do yours, and we'll get to Robert's question. With the uh, the Grunden common like apparatus, I would just wonder if like any of that same like backbone has been is being uh, like expanded at all. I should really find out. Just it's you know it, for commingle, it kind of it relates to the idea of like how can the technology and sort of the system that's being created to run one of these be implemented like in in other ways. So it would be, uh, I think I, I want to do a little research to see how much they've been able to kind of like use their template and apply it elsewhere. But yeah, so Robert yeah, says, what does he say? He says, after reading the YouGov piece on UK UBI, should affordability for a national UBI be a measure of a country's financial health? I think that's interesting because one of the things... We think about like when we talk about commingle and, and uh, eventually going international, right? We're starting in the U.S. One because we're here, but also it has um, a built-in banking system that we can sort of use efficiently, in theory. And then as we get big enough to scale, um, it sort of makes sense to us to go to other, uh, you know, wealthier countries where we could spin up a commingle very quickly and start generating more and more revenue to the point where if we want to go to, to a place that doesn't have a, a, a strong banking infrastructure and doesn't have a high enough average income of the population to really support its own basic income all by itself, then does that suggest that uh, we find a way to endow those things and give give it some sort of subsidy, which, um, which to me says... Uh, like that is a that is potentially a good measure of a of a nation's of a nation's financial health and economic health is how good of a basic income and how and like what level of basic needs could be supported by redistribution with their, within their own country and how much needs to be international intranational um you know redistribution uh in terms of resources i don't know i think i have a different take on this where I, I guess I don't know if I'm if I'm understanding the question as asked entirely, but when it comes to like measuring a country's financial health, like I guess 
We were just talking about Guyana and clearly they're doing very well suddenly, having found all this natural wealth that a lot of the world wants. And um, it just kind of like came out of nowhere where they have so much wealth, they're trying to figure out what to do with it. And the best way that they've been finding is these universal cash payments uh, until they figure out a better idea of what to do this on a permanent basis, which may be UBI. But I think when people look at this, and it's kind of related to the technology angle too, where you're thinking, okay, we're going to have so much productivity that through technology, we're not going to, people aren't going to be able to find jobs. We're going to have to issue some kind of dividend. And then so people think, well, the only way that we could do this is if there's like a lot of technology or a lot of natural wealth like Alaska. And I think they're missing that this could actually be a development tool. We who heavily research UBI know that this is actually, you know, not something that hurts employment. This is something that has a very small impact on employment and actually aids self-entrepreneurship, uh, I mean, self-employment. And this actually, you know, puts money into the economy to spend in businesses that it actually can be a tool that like grows GDP. And if you look at this as an investment, this is an investment with a high return on investment. Um, so no country should say, we don't have the money to do this. They should look at this as we need to make this investment. And we know that if we do, then we're going to be end up better off down the road, that we will see more GDP, we'll see more entrepreneurship, we'll see more thriving businesses. Um, so I don't think that we should we should look at like the idea of can we afford it um, as being somehow something about you know a limiting factor of of a country's financial health. Like this is a choice uh, to actually invest in your people or not. Well, is it limited by like which countries operate on fiat currency, or does everybody these days? I don't actually know to the level. Like I know the MMT arguments for the U.S. is we can sure. create money as an investment. But if you're gold backed and you only have a certain amount of resources to distribute that like a household, then you, you maybe you're, it's not whether or not you can afford a ba basic income, but like how big could it be? Would it be below subsistence levels just because of lack of access to resources? True. Like, so if you, if you do issue your own currency, you do have a greater ability to do this kind of thing, but you're not, it's not impossible to do this otherwise, especially if you, you recognize the fact that taxation can function as the clawback mechanism. So you can actually pair this with taxes like on those with higher incomes. And this is not going to be too expensive. Like it, it's a good idea to reduce poverty, even if that amount is on the lower end. Let's say it would be similar to the US doing a basic income of like uh, $200 a month, but like one seventh or one eighth of the current poverty line. Um, and yet that would have a large impact on poverty and poverty is so expensive that that would be good. So like in South Africa, I guess is another thing where they've got, um, what is it? The unemployment rate is around 30% right now. And they're looking at making this basic income grant, which would start off going only to the unemployed um, but by actually uplifting those people and actually enabling them to spend in the economy, you know, that's actually good for economic growth. Like it's not bad for economic growth. So even though, you know, even though it's expensive and even though there's so much unemployment, it should not be seen as something like, oh, we can't do this because we have so many people unemployed. It's the reverse. You want to employ people, and so you've got to create a floor of some kind, however small. Right. I think I think the thing to keep in mind is not whether or not countries can afford UBI, but how 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 big of a UBI can be afforded. Like at any level, it's arguably worth it. I think by the math and the efficiencies of it. But if, if currency that we're redistributing or distributing in some way is ultimately just a marker for access to resources and it's a country that's resource poor, it's going to be a, a, hard, a hard limit on how much, how, like how, I guess, fulfilling or survivable a basic income can be in a place that's like in the middle of the desert 
with no oil reserves or whatever um, to lean on, right? And, and in those cases, it seems like to have, um, you know, the sort of North Star idea of a, ba of a basic income being enough to like live and be safe uh, to a certain degree, um, it might require international subsidy uh, for places that are either resource poor or so far behind on economic development that um, they need they need to get, you know, sort of a kickstart. Yeah, I think I'd sure. see it or a little bit what like Scott is. Yeah, like what Scott, I think, is saying, at least to me, is that like that just the question of affordability is kind of like it's not it doesn't really it, it's it's based on this idea that there's that there's money scarcity, right, that that we just don't have enough so we can't do it. Right. Whereas this money isn't like, like when you're collecting, it's not like, like baseball cards or like, you know, some sort of collector's item where like the less of it you have, the more valuable it is. Right. Like the, the, the dollar is a container of value. It is not in itself valuable, right? Like, I think there's like a disconnect there where you think because there's not enough circulating around, like that it's all, the, the value of it is based on how much is circulating around, which I think is not really that accurate. Like it's the value of it is based on like a million other things, right? Uh, so it just kind of, it's, it's a really interesting question, a way of thinking of it. Like is, is the amount that you can afford to give the people that live in a country an indicator of how rich you are, right? Like it's saying like your family is rich because your kids get a, a big allowance, right? But maybe you're actually just a family that gives your kids a big allowance because your kids are working hard, right? Like there's, it's not because you I don't know. It's. It, I think it, it goes back to like how they're trying to frame the the arguments against the um, Oregon rebate. That it's like we just can't afford it, right? It's just too much. And I think there's the the the, the sort of the type of thinking that Scott's doing is very much like about tearing out tearing apart that idea, at least in my head. Yeah, um, and I think too that you know when it comes to this like let's say kind of scarcity logic of saying okay we only have this amount of tax revenue to use um, and if you're thinking about it that way and maybe it would be particularly low amount to go uh, a basic income for everyone that even though i still think that you should uh what you could do too is do you know like a universal child allowance like that's the first thing you do because that's the highest roi thing you can do um, just because of, you know, we see study after study has these very large multipliers for lifting children out of poverty. So, you know, that again should be seen as this development tool. Like you should never look at a child allowance as being too expensive. Like we can't come up with the money for it because that ROI is, is massive. You're talking about like 10 to right. one. Cause you're, you have to multiply the benefits of bringing someone out of poverty by the amount of time that they have left to live and be members of society. So if you take someone who's 50 and getting ready for retirement and lift them out of poverty, it's a great thing to do and it's worth it. But if you take someone who's five and prevent yeah. them from going into foster care systems and being in poverty forever, that's an entire lifespan of uh, engagement with society, whether it's how much they're working or how much crime is in their, their, falling into or whatever, all the costs compound, just like all the benefits compound. So you take one, I think about with bootstraps, we take uh, a lot where we look at the, how it affected someone who was in that situation of nearing retirement. And it's basically like shore yourself up, get a little bit safe so that you're not going to get hurt. Whereas for like a five-year-old kid, it was like, get off on the right track, just like the, the people in the outliers we were talking about, so that you have a much more you have a much better chance of becoming a Nobel Prize winner uh, and enormous contributors to society over the course of your life. The the next thing, and this is this ties in too with even um, a lot of what we've been talking about as well. But first of all, I want to provide some context too, so people know about this. Uh, people, I want people to know about the Marika program. And again, so the Marika is located in Brazil, and 
they too are like this this wealthier area, you know, thanks to having this natural resource wealth. And what they did is create a local currency called the Mambaka. Um, you can see here, like they created this currency in 2013. And, um, and then in uh, January 2017, they started like those who were part of the Bolsa Familia program, uh, which again, these Mambakas. And then in December 2019, uh, all citizens and families with income up to three minimum wages uh, and enrolled in the Unified National Registry for Social Policies began receiving 130 mambakas per month. And so that was going to about 43,000 people. And that was about uh, uh, a quarter of Marika's population. So that's like, it's not universal basic income, but 25% of people getting this is is pretty big. And then that amount was increased to uh, 300 a month in uh, during COVID. And that was interesting too, how like they had this program, it's like they had these pipes set up so that they were able to start getting extra money through these pipes during this, this, um, this catastrophe due to the pandemic. And then after the pandemic, uh, they lowered it down to 170, and then more recently, it's been increased back up to uh, 200 per month, and then also more recently it has has in gone to more people. So now it's like uh, about more than double. Of, of it. So now it's like with 91,000 people, over 91,000 people getting this is like half of Marika uh, getting what is now 230. Uh, mambakas per month and then they're also looking about fully extending this uh, within the next uh, will it be four years now so that um, like the mayor has said that uh, in the next five years and this was written like over a year ago um, then all citizens living in Marika for three years or more there's almost 200,000 people will be receiving this and so they expect this to be a full basic income. And this is, uh, you know, already about half the people are getting this. This is already having a, a real impact in Marika. And I should also mention too, that this is, since this is through this uh, Mambaka local currency, it's slightly different. It's still, it's cash, but it's local cash. So you you spend it locally. You It's, it's a lot of places you can go into a store and use it there but what you can't do is use it on like brazil's amazon or whatever and um spend it as as ordinary you know brazilian dollars so it's it, it's still slightly different but you can basically use it as anything locally and so i just want everyone to know about that this is going on because the next thing i wanted to talk about was the very first study of this Marika basic income. And so this, this just came out yesterday. Brand new, brand new study. And I'm already seeing some misinformation about it, and I expect to see more about it. And so I wanted to make sure that we get out ahead of this and talk about like what the study actually found and what's even being said about it so people know. Okay, so I guess I just tweeted about this too, and maybe I'll, I'll throw up a, an image of this in the edited version, but the, the misinformation part is uh, that work decreased by 17%, and that's not the case. Uh, what it found was that during the study period, which was um, mid 2021 to early 2022, that income from employment decreased 17. So, like that's the that's the true part. But labor hours did not decrease by that much. Labor hours decreased on average overall by one hour per week 
which was not statistically significant. So again, this is similar to the open research pilot, which found also around that amount is a little bit over one hour per week. And that worked out to 15 minutes per workday. And then this works out to essentially 12 minutes per workday. But this was not a statistically significant finding, even with, you know, was 40,000 people receiving this. So this is a very large permanent program with a statistically insignificant impact on hours worked. What it did find was that people earned less. And I think that is really interesting from the pandemic perspective, because it seems like the most likely explanation is that people started working jobs that paid less. And during the pandemic, that makes a lot of sense because, um, you know, in the, the beginning of the study period in 2021, this was um, right when um, the biggest impacts were happening in Brazil. So it made the most sense to avoid uh, putting yourself in a situation where you could be exposed to COVID. So I think what people did is they used their basic income to find jobs that were safer for them. And even though they those jobs paid less, but people chose to work those jobs because they were safer. And is that a bad thing? I would argue, of course not. Like that's not a bad thing because their income still increased overall and you still had this economic impact where people had more money to spend. But that actually saved, you know, I I don't know how much it saved, but it definitely resulted in fewer people ending up in the hospital, most likely, which saved money for the Brazilian healthcare system. So one thing I can I can hear is the um the responses coming from people, anti UBI people, when you hear something like this and um and I'm thinking of the ones on the left who like to often say if we have a basic income, we'll basically just be subsidizing Walmart to pay even worse wages. Um, and this could be interpreted in that way to, to, um, to be like, see now, now companies could pay like more abusive non-living wages because the government was subsidizing it. Um, and what, what do you, what would you say to that? I, I feel like there's a lot of like, well, what were these companies that we'd have to know and what were these jobs and why were they chosen? But I can see that being the immediate pushback to that sort of argument. Yeah. It, I, I think that, um, so there's, there's an, there's an argument to be made that let's say when you look at Walmart and you look at how many people working at Walmart, uh, are receiving snap benefits and like how messed up that is, how Walmart should actually pay more. Uh, but there's no incentive for Walmart to pay more because you only get SNAP benefits if you're in poverty, if you're you know beneath this, this line. And Walmart knows that. So why should they? Um, the difference is with basic income, you don't lose that income ever and you have that before the job. So you actually have the power to say, I'm not going to work at Walmart. And if you have that power to not work at Walmart, then you can actually only work at Walmart if you get paid more. So we want there to be that impact. Like it's a good thing if people are choosing not to work at jobs that they don't want because those jobs should pay more. And the only way for those jobs to pay more is if they get that signal. Right. So I, I, I feel like... Um... The argument I always have is like, it depends on the nature of the job. I would imagine some jobs that are less desirable will have to pay more. Like who's going to clean the toilets, yeah. the people you pay enough, who's going to, you know, um, be a, a, a daycare worker or a, something that they find really fulfilling, like a good example, or like who's going to do community theater, like a lot more people. Cause now they can, they have the time and they just truly enjoy it. Um, so I, I wish, or I hope at some point there's like, because it's always like, what is the nature of the job? When you give people the ability to say no to it, you also give the people the ability to say yes to it. So in this case, in when they're just saying, here's a broad 
overall average economic outcome in terms of the number of hours worked less or the number of dollars earned less. It's like, well, what what is the actual nature of the jobs people are moving into? Are they move are they doing more like volunteering and passion based and just generally fulfilling jobs or are they working like at abusive companies that pay less, uh, which I don't expect, but it's just not, it's not seemingly addressed yet. Yeah. I just think that's such like, it is such a powerful component of basic income that I like to summarize as the freedom to the power to say no and the freedom to say yes, where you, you want jobs that people don't want to pay more and you want jobs that people love to be something that that more people can say yes to and so i don't consider it a bad thing at all like if uh, you know let's say right now the logic is teachers don't get paid enough and that's true we should pay teachers more and it's it's so hard to actually do that because like teacher salaries are limited by let's say state revenue and budgets and stuff. And it's so hard to, to raise taxes, to pay teachers more. Like it's very challenging. And so you've, let's say the only way the, like the kind of maximum, you know, let's say it's like $30,000 somewhere for a teacher and that's just too low. Uh, so people who want to be a teacher, they're out there and they're choosing between this $30,000 teacher job that they really want. And like this $50,000, um, job doing something else that they don't really want, but they would rather have $50,000. And so if suddenly a basic income of $15,000 now means that that they can choose to work and have a total income of $45,000 as a teacher, and they could do that. And so, so someone can look at that and go, well, that's messed up because you know we should pay teachers more. And the the argument's still true that you know you should want to pay teachers more, but also you don't want teachers saying no because they can't afford to do it. And so if you make it more affordable, then that is a good thing where you can actually have more teachers. It's you're subsidizing being a teacher, and that's what we want. And you're reducing the premium people who do that really valuable work of teaching have to pay uh in order to do work that is fulfilling. Like part of your payment as a teacher is the knowledge that you're changing lives and helping the world. Whereas uh, you don't get that as like a middle manager for a, a, you know, a call center um, that does spam. So people who work those jobs generally have to get paid a whole lot more because they know they, they work bullshit jobs in general. Yeah, it's interesting. I, it's, I mean, I would love to know the data so that I could just say to someone, Look, this wasn't like the local, the local, uh, you know, use, uh, abusive like chain chain store, seeing that people were getting money and then reducing their pay uh, equally because now they could. This was people going to different jobs they wanted more that just happened to pay less, but they were now able to do that and. You know, no one really has a leg to stand on in terms of arguing that until we until we actually know the nature of the jobs people people had and and moved to. Yeah, in this in this study, there was no like the researchers didn't have actual data uh, to determine this. It just it makes the most sense. You know, they're they're not able to they weren't able to see okay they were in just job and now they're in this job, and then like having that detail they didn't have that. But just the fact that incomes went down from employment, and this was during the pandemic, like I think that's the best explanation of of how that occurred, and that's like the what they think you know that they wrote in the study that they makes the most sense, right. and you know I agree maybe, maybe when we're doing research like with commingle or maybe just in general people doing research in pilots that are like studying the macro like job movement type stuff, like an easy metric to pair it with is sort of the David, David Graeber bullshit jobs metric, where it's like, we can measure, yes, how many hours people are working, how much people are getting paid per hour, but also measure how many people think their job is bullshit. Like if we, if we can pair like the idea of people making less, but also feeling better about the work that they're doing, then it, 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 it shows that they they've made a choice for higher value, like inherent value employment rather than higher 
um, financial reward employment, and that has been enabled, right? Yeah, so, like, that's a great that would be an easy question to, to be like, do you like your job more? Um, and and track that. Yeah. So there's a there's a couple of things about the program. This is from the summary that I just want to make sure people know too. And so I'll just read I'll just read the highlights so people know them. All right. A beneficiary saw a significant increase in income. Recipient households showed a nine percent increase in household income relative to non-recipient households. Uh, consumption did not decrease increase on a per capita level, but rose by five percent at the household level, indicating recipients used some of the increase in income in, in uh, income towards consumption. Uh, I'll read the next thing first. There is a displacement of other income through the transfers. The study finds a reduction of seventy nine dollars USD of household income when the transfer is not taken into account, driven by reductions in labor income. Uh, this suggests that the uh, transfer allowed households to change jobs or stay home really during the pandemic. So that's the stuff we talked about. Uh, but I just wanted to emphasize again that overall incomes went up. Even though incomes went down for employment, overall incomes went up. And that's just, you know, I, I saw the same thing with the Oprah Research Study where people you know, were saying, oh, it didn't work because, you know, incomes went down. And it's like, well, again, incomes overall went up. Like you were actually able to reduce poverty directly with this very small impact on employment. And if you were to look at that and say it didn't work, like I don't understand because you actually, you did what it was meant to accomplish successfully. It increased incomes. If you did a basic income pilot and incomes went down with the basic income included, that would actually be making people poorer. And that would be something to really question. Like I, that would be to me a failure to some degree to show that you attempted to raise people's incomes directly and you actually reduced them. Like, but we've never seen that. That's not what happens. Yeah. It's a multivariate question in general. When they look at each like statistic one at a time and like, here's what happened to income. Here's what happened to this. And it's like kind of separates the thing when everyone's life is a jumble of all these factors where it's like the main measure should be the health and well-being being of the people and the contribution to society of the people where if someone makes less money but their kid sees their parent for five more hours a day and gets and gets a good track on life right. that balances itself out but if we're only looking at one of those things at a time then we're going to be like oh this percentage of people you know did a better job raising their kids cuz they could spend more time but this percentage of people like lost uh income but we're not matching those things up and seeing that they are it's a direct it's the ability for those people to actually choose um that path yeah and along those lines here are more these are more impacts uh positive impacts that like weren't really income related so the study found that the program had a larger positive impact on households headed by women and on households with minors. So that was a dis disproportionate impact for them. And uh, it delivered health and education benefits without imposing conditionalities. So again, like this is in Brazil, and Brazil has the Bolsa Familiar program, which is a conditional cash transfer payment where it goes to people in poverty. But in order to receive it, you have to, um, I believe the kids have to be in school. And this is not like imposing any conditions like this educational requirement. And, you know, the assumption is that you aren't going to see an impact on education unless you have that condition. And that's not the case. Uh, the study found positive impacts on the health and educational outcomes of children, particularly an increase in hours devoted to schoolwork and routine doctor visits. So, um, and then that wasn't found to be uh, uh, statistically significant, um, but at the same time, they, they did find that. Uh, and so it's just interesting that you can look at this like actual permanent program and see that kids are actually benefiting from it. They're actually doing more schoolwork. And despite the fact that the program did not require people do not require kids to do that which is like in this particular situation normal 
in Brazil to actually have these educational requirements. And then the other thing was the fact that this was during COVID, which uh, also is something that was part of the open research pilot, where again, like that started during COVID when most of the recipients were unemployed because of the COVID impacts. And so here too, you've got the study that took place during this kind of maximal impact situation. And um, what they found was, you know, that this was this was helpful during this, that it, they couldn't, they didn't necessarily measure the impacts directly uh, because that would, you know, be extremely difficult to figure out like, oh, you, um, you know, reduce hospitalization by COVID during a pandemic by like 3% or something. But indirectly, you could assume that there was some positive impact because of the fact that people seem to be choosing safer jobs. My very first article I ever wrote about basic income, I wrote about how um, like one of the savings we should see and, and consider to be like subtracting from the cost of basic income um, is what's called uh, presenteeism. And so this is when you go to work despite being sick and you know you're sick, you know you're likely to get other people sick, but you need the money. And that actually ends up costing the entire economy. It's around uh, $200 billion a year because what happens is you do get other people sick and then they can't go to work or their productivity is decreased because they're sick at work. And that ends up you know, reducing... Uh, that ends up having this big cost that we don't consider as a cost. So in a pandemic in particular, but also just in general, if you have this basic income program where people can actually choose to stay home when they're sick, then you could actually save a lot of money and increase overall productivity from fewer people being sick. I'm also very uh, interested in the logistical advantages of having built the pipes, as you sort of mentioned earlier. Right. So this Marika um, experiment or this pilot or this program actually uh, existed before the pandemic. And when the pandemic happened, they were a, they already had the, the pipes in place to say, OK, it was 130. Now it's 300 and respond immediately. While as we in America are like months and months debating about to do it, whether or not to do it, and then taking months to get the money to people and like signing our names on it and all that stuff. Um, whereas they, they could just like change it immediately, which is exactly like what we sort of experienced with the bootstraps pilot is it was originally supposed to end before the, the pandemic. And we had a certain reason for extending it. That wasn't actually because of the COVID because of COVID because we didn't know it was happening yet, but we could have just, we had the infrastructure in place just to turn it on. And we had extended it uh, just sort of coincidentally as COVID was starting and, and the, the pipes were in place, not only for, for it to easily decide, let, let, let's make this, th this uh, benefit longer, but let's also like uh, one of our, one of our guys, because he was now connected to the banking system and hadn't been before was able to get a stimulus check when a stimulus check finally came. So the, the idea of just getting the pipes like a circular circulatory system where you can very easily and quickly and always get, money to people and resources to people um, without having to invent some sort of creative way or logistical nightmare to make it happen is incredibly valuable. And I would, um, I would imagine it saved the people of Marika like a lot of heartache and pain in like the whole wait for it to happen and the figure out how to implement it. It was already set up. Bump the number. Yeah. It really does make a difference to have those pipes in place. There's a there's a couple other things that that I wanted to mention about the Marika thing. One is that's interesting to me is that they use their own sort of local uh, currency, um, and we've explored that idea too. For if we're running like local pilots for commingle, is would there be a way we could partner with a local currency um, such that uh, all the all the money shifting around is more incentivized to be spent locally? Like say it's a tourist town that that. Uh, Basically, all the people who work there and sor serve the the tourism um, can't afford to do anything in town. They have to kind of like drive in, and they're eventually get, they're slowly getting priced out of their homes. Um, and the stores can't price their goods such that the people in town can buy them because 
they need to set them at the price point that the tourists are able to pay. But if you have like a local currency that's going around between people in an area, then you can set two price points. Here's the, you know, the U S dollar price point and here's the local bucks price point. So that now you have not only people in town being able to afford things better, but also the, the businesses in town being able to find a secondary market and a whole new market of people um, and keeping more money locally. So there's some really interesting stuff that can happen if you're creating these markets by getting new money in the hands of new people and you're, 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 you're giving them access. And the, the way they did it with the, the, local, the local currency is really interesting to me. Yeah, I would love to see more implementations of local currency uh, for, for basic income programs and pilots, for sure. And then the one other thing that really strikes me about this is you said they started, when was it like 2016 or 2017 or a long time oh, ago? When, when did Bolsa Familia start? Well, Bolsa Familia is different. This started going like through Bolsa Familia, but it's not the Bolsa Familia program. I can't remember what what's called without looking. The things I, I want to know, like people look at all these different metrics and try to decide like, oh, people work less or more, or here's these statistics about whether or not we think it's a good thing to do. Um, and in order to like really have a full understanding of what I'm about to ask, I would I would need to know like how their politics works, like how they decide um, what direction they're going to go with the program. But the fact that you you walked us through this whole progression of like 2017, they bumped it to that. 2018, they bumped it to that. 2020, they bumped it here. 2021, they they brought it down a little. The idea that, uh, but they ex they're expanding it to everyone within the next three years. That watching this progression of a program that keeps getting doubled down on and amped up and amped up sort of indicates something very powerful, which is that the people of Marika like it and they want it to keep going and they want it to keep growing, right? That sh seemingly should be the number one indicator of whether or not a program is working unless you're in a situation where it's just like some dictator is handing down policy and everyone hates it. But that doesn't seem like what's happening. It seems like what they're doing is working. And us trying to like come up with our own metrics for whether or not it's working uh, without considering like, well, why, why do they keep continuing it? Why do they keep growing the program year after year? Yeah, we should mention too that the, the, the overall context of Brazil is also special in that I, I don't, I think still a lot of people don't know that Brazil is actually the first country to have passed a basic income law. And, you know, they passed this in 2004. Um, it's just the 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 small print is that it's up to the president to implement universally. So he started with the Bolsa Familiar program, which is this targeted payment. But from the very beginning, it was meant to expand and provide a basic income to everyone in Brazil. But it just hasn't happened yet. And so even when the most recent president came in, they, they did some, some like rejiggering of the language around like what they're wanting to do. That seems like more positive towards like, yes, we actually do want to do this. Uh, but like the legislation exists and they actually can do that. So in that context, you've got this like local implementation of what the rest of the country has already decided to do. And they're actually doing what the rest of the country said that they should be doing. And so from that perspective, like, I love how they're setting this example at the local level and saying, let's live up to the law that we passed and actually do this because it does work. And every time we expand it, it has more and more like positive impacts and not these negative impacts that people are afraid of. Which is super encouraging for what we're trying to do with commingle in terms of like the whole premise is if it were, it's like if you build it, and then if it works, sort of a model, like we're really just kind of putting, you know, taking the leap of faith and seeing, do people come? Does it work? Can we show uh, demonstrable impact? Um, and then if so, does that does that grow it and grow it and grow it in the way it keeps seemingly growing in Marika and or in the way it never is, it, it's unassailable to have their version of UBI in Alaska. Like if if we get this going, will it? sort of have its own built-in resilience because people are happy about how it works. Um, so yeah, it's really good to see some sort of uh, ongoing growth and some sort of permanence in similar models because we're sort of banking on that. 
with what we're trying. And uh, yeah, so one more thing I wanted to cover before we before we go um, is there's actually another pilot study. So like there's more evidence to discuss, and this is from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. This uh, this the study just came out uh, a couple couple weeks ago. So again, this is a pretty new study too. Here I'll go over to the to link to this. Um, this was actually another example of uh, full universality. So this was a, an entire village there received this. Uh, every adult got the equivalent of twenty dollars per month, and every child got the equivalent of uh, ten dollars per month USD. After two years, substantial changes were observed uh, in the UBI village for several key factors, uh, including housing, health, and diet variety compared to the control village. Uh, the findings suggest that the intervention has positively affected socioeconomic conditions of the UBI recipients in a village located, and this was in an artisanal mining zone, effects on socioeconomic well-being. Uh, so this was looking at like judging people's improvements based on housing. We know like uh, it's common to judge like how people, uh, how a householder is doing based on it's like type of roof and walls and stuff. And um, the study confirmed that there was a significant increase in households living in a house with metal roofs in the UBI village. And several of the UBI village uh, people uh, invest in batteries and solar uh, solar panels too. Um, I thought that was pretty cool to see. I always like it when uh, we find that there's like investing in green energy and stuff in these villages. It contributed to diet quality improvement. So in the UBI village, fish it became a larger daily component of their diet. And um, uh, the data was less conclusive regarding effects on job variety and entrepreneurship. There was a decrease in number of art artisanal miners in this like artisanal mining village in a, uh, an increase in those who taken up jobs other than mining or farming. So that seems like, you know, probably um, temporary because this is not, you know, the, the base kingdom itself is, is temporary. So they're likely gonna have to go back to their old jobs unless they start up some like, su successful business. But also interesting, they invested and in, like the miners invested in protective mining equipment. More than 70% of miners in the village were wearing rubber boots at end lined. So that's just kind of cool that, you know, you're in a position, you're like, you have a job that's dangerous and you know, they know that they can't really do another job in this, you know, particular area. That's the job. Imagine like coal miners doing this, but they were able to afford safer protective equipment. You know, like that's really important. It's really interesting too, this idea of an artisanal miner, it kind of took me aback, like, what is an artisanal miner? It's like you're, we're so used to it being such an industrial corporate endeavor, right. mining. And it's it's a reminder that like people lead very different lives in different parts of the world, different circumstances. And it's important to have a program that allows them to adapt to their needs based on what they're seeing in their specific circumstances. Like I wouldn't have even, if I'm trying to write policy for like populations of millions of people, and I don't have even a conception of the idea of artisanal mining, I'm not going to write very good policy. It's better to put power in the hands of the people who that's their situation to be like, what do we need to get done? We Let's go do it. Yeah. And um, I'll end with the, the health impact. Uh, so the number of respondents feeling healthy or very healthy increased substantially in the UBI village to reach 83% contrary to the control village, which was 53%. The UBI village showed a strong increase in the proportion of inhabitants able to buy medication, either for themselves or for their sick children. We should consider these figures caution because of the small number of people who confirmed having been sick. So then, again, this is a, a village and you know, there's a few people getting sick, but I think that's, that's fascinating that if you were to like ask people if they're healthy or very healthy, there was a 30 percentage point difference between the UBI village and the control village. And again, this is so limited to the the here and now sort of data that they're reaping during the course of this, whatever it was, two year or whatever. Two years, trial. yeah. But you mentioned children and health, and I immediately think uh, that kid's entire life is going to be very different. 
And so the, some of the, the meteor data and um, outcomes and impact will be, if you go back to the same population in 30 years uh, and compare it to a control population in 30 years, um, what do the differences look like then? Like how many knock on changes like led to rising tide effects and compounding of um, well, just, I, I was talking to someone before both misfortune and fortune compound, right? The poorer you are, the more hurdles and obstacles you have and you kind of get sucked in it. And when, the more sort of um, power you gain in terms of resources and access, the more you can amplify it. And it's even written directly into our economic system is where you get charged interest for having debt and you get given interest for having money. It's just all of these things compound. So you take someone who's a kid and you start them down a healthier, happier path, especially in a family that's less stressed out. That changes that uh, changes their entire future. Yeah, really sets them off on the right footing, which is what's lacking for so many people, right? Well, we have a uh, we've reached the end of the this episode of the Basic Income Show. Please uh, give it a like and uh, comment in the replies. Please share it with others if you enjoyed it too. Subscribe to the channel on YouTube. Artists. Do they need to smash the like buttons or can they just click them? Like I'm used to being told to smash the like button. Like, does it work the same? Please you know, smash. Like... Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't read any smash studies preferred. <laughs> about the, uh, the difference in pressure applied to the buttons. <laughs> <laughs> ah, <laughs> they are pressure sensitive. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See you guys. Uh, and yeah, it's a, uh, Halloween tomorrow. Happy Halloween. If you're watching this later, it's, it's too late for that, but I hope you enjoyed a, ha a happy Halloween. And uh, yeah, see you next time.